Good morning once again to all who are listening today. I pray that as I work through the image I've chosen for today, that my thoughts will open you or remind us of insights into the character and purpose of God our Father, whom we serve through Jesus Christ, His Son. May His Holy Spirit inspire you with grace and renewed energy to do His will, even though it may seem impossible from your point of view. I'm going to read from 1 Samuel 16, verses 2 to 7, where we see Samuel having been sent to Bethlehem by God to find and anoint the new king who would succeed Saul, who had fallen from grace in the sight of the Lord in the task of leading Israel. Let us read together. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Let us consider together the idea of looking at the heart and what this could mean for us in our daily walk with the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So what is it that people look at? There are a number of scenarios we could use to clarify this idea. The job interview, the new person in our community, the invitation, the reaction to a personality or an action or a situation. I was brought up knowing that first impressions are lasting impressions. Therefore, you always dressed your best for interviews, behaved your best at first meetings, etc. I was never really successful at first impressions because my mouth always tends to say things before my brain can stop it from doing so. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that unless somebody really takes the time to get to know me and what makes me tick, so to speak, That person will never have the correct version of who I truly am. If you're going to look at the outward appearance of me, you're going to be really confused about the actual me. I have a shocking sense of humor. I'm incredibly sensitive about things that even smell of rejection. I have a dreadfully loud and explosive laugh. I'm outspoken and I stand resolutely upon my beliefs. I do not trust people easily and the list could go on endlessly. Now, If those are the only things by which I'm going to be judged, I would not be considered good material to become a minister's wife, a missionary, or even maybe a friend, and probably not a good example of what people think a good Christian should look like. I would like to pose the question, what do you look for in a person being interviewed for a position in your company? How do you go about considering people to invite to your birthday bash? How do you respond to people who are not what the norm dictates they should be? How do you approach newcomers to your community or social circles? How do you judge those in the church and who are in positions of leadership in the church? My next question would be, how would God approach the above questions? And then, how does God want you to approach the above questions? He very specifically says, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I guess we could say that the elders of Bethlehem were looking at the outward appearance of Samuel, knowing him to be the mouthpiece of God. And when he spoke, it was usually a reprimand or an exhortation or a pronouncement of a judgment of some sort. And so they feared what they had done to displease the Lord. Only upon interrogating his purpose for being there did they relax and interact. Imagine if they had reacted to their initial fear or impression. David would not have become king, 
and the bloodline of Jesus would have had a major hiccup. We might have ended up singing the hymn at Christmas time, O Little Town of Bochenbulsdal, or some such thing. The Oxford Dictionary defines the word look as the following. To direct one's gaze towards someone or something in a, or in a specified direction. To think of or regard someone or something in a specified way. Now the word gaze is defined as to look steadily and intently in admiration, surprise or thought, which usually embody certain aspects of the relationship between the observer and the observed. Synonyms for the word look in this context could be to gaze, stare, gape, peer, watch, examine, study, inspect, scan, scrutinize, contemplate, consider, take note of. The word heart in this context is defined as the central or innermost part of something, an allegiance, courage, enthusiasm, the vital part or the essence. So God is not looking at anyone, including me and you, from what our outward appearance may be, or the facade we are presenting, presenting to the world around us. But he is directing his gaze, peering, watching, examining, studying, inspecting, scanning, scrutinizing, mm -hmm. contemplating, considering, taking note of what lies in the innermost parts of our soul, the very essence of our beings, the things to which we ally ourselves, the things that we allow to influence our thinking and behavior. He is considering how we live and implement the learned life-changing aspects of the relationship between him and ourselves. So I guess my next question would be, how do you allow the word of God as presented in the Bible to change you? Do we read or hear the word being preached and respond in awe of its profundity and then walk away from it saying, but I'm a sinner. I cannot be expected to be like that. God created me the way I am, so I must just live with it. Take me or leave me. Or do we respond by working out our salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord? Do we confess and show remorse for our weaknesses? Do we make every effort to come to a place of avoiding making the same mistakes again and again? Do we try to look past the weaknesses of our brothers and sisters in Christ and honour them as joint heirs of the Son of God, worthy of salvation, grace and mercy, in the same way we are worthy of salvation, grace and mercy? Do we interrogate their motives, their shortcomings, their life's experiences, or do we simply react in judgment to that which we see? We will notice that before they could present a sacrifice to the Lord, they had to be consecrated. This is in the scripture we read. I think this may be a forgotten but essential element of bringing our hearts before the Lord for examination. How often do we enter into his presence and simply present our shopping lists to him and even tell him how he should achieve our desired outcomes? How often do we actually tell him how we feel about him as our omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God? How often do we consecrate ourselves in his presence by confession and renunciation before we worship or pray or read his word? I remember so clearly as a child coming to church with my parents and entering a, sp a space where there was silence, heads were bowed in prayer, and there was an atmosphere of reverence and awe. What has happened to that? In our efforts to be more relevant and forward-looking and embracing, relaxing in order to make church a warmer, more welcoming space for newcomers and oldcomers, I guess, we have forgotten the concept of be still and know that I am God. We have forgotten to take the time to just be still. How intently do we listen for his voice? How often do we try to discern his will before we jump in where angels fear to tippy toe? I would take this opportunity to exhort us, me and you, as the children of God, to examine our hearts to see what it is that God sees before we examine the hearts of others. Whatever you see that causes a twinge of guilt, shame, regret, the need to justify yourself, then bring that before the Lord. Confess your weakness, renounce it in whatever way is necessary, and allow him to take it from you. Allow him to give you a new heart, and then do everything in your power to make reparation where damage has been done. 
During the prayer meeting this morning, the word remorse came so loud and clear to my spirit. This is another element of consecration that has been forgotten in the society of today that has become so self-centered and self-absorbed. We have become a community of blame shifters, of deflectors. How much pain and misunderstanding would be avoided if we would just learn to say, I'm sorry, I messed up. It is so much easier to practice the discipline of forgiveness if remorse is shown, if confession is made and words of apology and admission of fault are spoken. Let us encourage one another to speak our confessions to each other instead of expecting others around us to be mind readers or to understand sudden changes in our behavior. In the book of James, chapter 5, verse 16, we are taught to confess our sins to each other and to pray for each other so that we may be healed because the prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. It is one thing to realize we have messed up. It is quite another to swallow our pride and confess our mess to those who have been affected by it. Let us become a people who do not expect others to simply take us mm -hmm. as we come and to accommodate us as we are, but rather be a people who acknowledge responsibility, who welcome accountability, and who consciously speak out words of remorse, words of forgiveness, and words of healing over each other. Let us focus on ourselves and not on others. Let us look for the good rather than the fault. Let us allow the word of God to change our own hearts and renew our spirits within us. Let us pray together now from Psalm 19. We acknowledge, Father, that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord are true, being all, altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them indeed we are your we your servants are warned. In keeping them is great reward. Who can discern his own errors? Cleanse us from our hidden faults. Keep your servants from willful sins, that they may they not rule over us. Then we will be blameless and cleansed of great transgression. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.